Good afternoon, South Africa. Welcome to Afternoon Express live on SABC3. Now, South Africa has woken up to some terrible news this morning, and that is the passing of veteran and jazz legend Mr. Ray Pui. We'd like to extend our condolences to his family during this very difficult time and be comforted by all the warm messages and the love that is pouring out to him from South Africans everywhere. Now, we have a very exciting show coming up. Some incredible women join us in the loft today. We have the ladies from the celebrated film Couture and usable water levels in Cape Town are still very low. Councillor Xanthia Limburg joins us in the loft to tell us more. Good afternoon and welcome to the show. My name is Jeannie D. Today we certainly do have an incredible, incredible show lined up for you. Now, it's not every day that we have royalty on the show. Princess Chantel from the Cats Corana Royal House is here and we're celebrating the Khoisan heritage and culture today. So we've decided to make a dish inspired by the original diet. Now, this consisted of mainly meat and roots from the desert. Clem, how were you inspired today to create something? that we can whip up in this kitchen. Well, I really was inspired. When I started like putting all these dishes and ideas together, things started being like, started sounding very familiar. Yeah. And it's kind of weird. The cuisine has almost come around 360 and it's very much the paleo diet. Well, the paleo man is very much what the bushman exactly. was. Yeah, and this is absolutely is. amazing. So it's number one, using exactly only the ingredients that you have, yeah. which is my biggest philosophy, working with the ingredient as the hero always. Exactly. So smiling ear to ear, because we're using delicious fatty lamb ribs today. We yeah. could have been easily like replaced with some chem spork or blessed pork. And then we do some root vegetables. I got some carrots and sweet potato. All right. Really easy. Should we just get started while we're Let's here? Let's do it. And you can join us as well. If you'd like to cook along with us, all you need to do is SMS the keyword lamb to double three six five zero and we'll text you the ingredients and of course the shopping list we're gonna get started with this now mm -hmm. and you know why this is such a good idea I remember when I went to the Kalahari and I actually met with a Bushman tribe that was living there what they said is it's such an amazing way of living because you know if you look at the Western world they buy 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 and then hoard and keep all this food and fr freezers and grocery cupboards and fridges where actually you just should have what you need for that day and the next day you figure it out. That's how my kitchen operates. Pretty so, much, it's an amazing philosophy. Yeah. So let's get straight to the recipe. So I'm using these amazing lamb ribs today. Delish. And what's, what's even better is, you can imagine um, those indigenous people at the time, they didn't have the luxury of Willie's down the road. Exactly. So they're not gonna have extra virgin olive oil. They literally have the animal as is. What's great? Lamb has beautiful fat on it, so it cooks in its own fat, yeah. which makes all the sense in the world. So we're going to season it some lightly with some stuff that they could have had back then. So obviously some salt and pepper, just yeah. look for some light seasoning. I think and garlic. lamb is such a great meat. It, it is really just is. so tasty. It's got enough flavor on its own. Mm. So some garlic, and I found out wild garlic actually does grow all over the country. So some, let's just imagine this is some wild garlic right now yeah. going in there. And then some, they did have some herbs as well, so whatever they would have found that would season the meat would have worked so well. Rosemary as well, wild rosemary, so that's mm. going to go in there. And then some chili. Beautiful. Just add a little bit of heat to it. Beautiful. So you want to marinate this, just, well, not for very long, it doesn't need that. So you give it a good toss, and that's going to go into the oven. Again, no need for any oil, there's enough oil that's on there already. Can I just do one thing here? Because show me, show me. I think take the garlic and like mush it along mm -hmm. so that every piece of meat gets that garlicky taste. Hey. Yeah. There you go. My contribution, my five cents. There we Basically go. Basically a chef. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Love it. So that's, and then that's that. That's that part completely done. It goes to the oven, back then like over a braai, totally sorted. Beautiful. So now we can get started on our root vegetables. Okay. So sweet potatoes, so there are so many varieties that we actually get right here in South Africa as well. We're going to use the orange one. And again, sweet potatoes are great because it's a great source of energy as well. And they're actually really delicious. Again, we're not- I've also never seen an orange sweet potato before have you not? in my entire life. Have you not? They're absolutely no. amazing. The variety is called the Beauregard sweet okay. potato. But they, I mean, you get purple, you get red, you get orange. So yeah, sweet potatoes come in just like people, like many forms and shapes. <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna cut this into wedges. Okay. This could also easily be bride over a fire. No need for any excess water. You'll notice we're actually not using any water with this recipe today. So okay. we're being very conscious about that. So this would be either bride over open fire mm -hmm. or deep fried or fried in the rendered fat from the lamb using what you have. Ooh. And I'd like a chip deep fried in some lamb fat. Yeah, <laughs> me too. To me. <laughs> when you put it that way. Yeah. Mm. So we just get that. <laughs> Adding some extra fat to those chips. There Sounds we go. delicious. And did you know, if you, uh, sweet potatoes continue to grow, you can actually cut a piece off of it 
leave it in the ground and it'll still grow. Which is really it's amazing. It's stemming, I believe. Kind of, in a sense, yes. Okay. What's really great is because, and obviously, hunter gatherers and being nomadic, in a sense, they actually looked out for their fellow man. So they did little like indicators where number one water could be found, yeah. and food as well. So I thought that was really, really amazing. So next time I'm like, like make lunch, I'll just leave a little flag there for Eugenie. Left something behind for you. Do you know that there is actually this incredible initiative and there's this girl in Cape Town and what she does is she go to, goes to parks and goes to freestanding areas where there's like water and mm -hmm. where there's sand and she plants things and leaves a little sign in it saying free food and she just plants food wherever she sees an available space in Cape Town. We should Town. all do that actually. What a beautiful initiative and this has just reminded there me. There we that go. I'm going to go planting sweet potatoes everywhere, everywhere. in Cape Town. <laughs> all right, mm -hmm. so some carrots. Some more, more of the root vegetables we spoke about. Carrots are really, really great. And did you know orange carrots are kind of a new thing? The original carrots were black, purple. rainbow, purple, yellow, all these funky colors. So Why did the colors of carrots change? I believe it was a country trying to hybridize them for their own color yeah. to actually have a national for veggie, and that's what I heard. Could exactly. be wrong. I'm going to Google well, I've it heard after of this. Similar story down the line, but I mean, those the purple ones, the red ones, they're the heirloom variety, which I think is really amazing. And yeah. we're seeing it come back into stores, so we yeah. start using all of I those. I love a purple carrot. Me too. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. So this is our beautiful, beautiful dish. When our lamb comes out <sighs> of the oven or off the braai, the veggies are beautifully roasted. We put a little bit of seasoning together, real easy. So I mean, really, this is something that I want to make on Heritage Day. Actually, you really should. This just screams of. Africa. <laughs> some cumin, coriander, some chili flakes, yeah. and then some mustard powder, which I am crazy about right cumin, now. Cumin, coriander, chili flakes, and mustard powder. And mustard powder, yeah. That's a good combo. Uh, it's really funky, and that mustard just kind of like, just blows your mind slightly. You're like, what Ooh. is that? So that's the mustard. So real easy. I'm gonna ask you just to do a little sprinkle of our veggies. On the already done one? On the already these? done veggies, yeah. Okay. And then you can finish off our lamb with a squeeze of lemon. We give it a nice, juicy, juicy one. I mean, is this going to be very spicy? It no, sounds not at really all. exciting. I can't wait go. to taste this. And you can squeeze it with so much style. Oh, yeah. Lamb always needs a little lemon. And look at our amazing dish. And you would think that this is so modern. It's actually, it's not. It's not. So I'm, I'm really, I'm, it's my new diet. This is rustic. It's good to serve. It's easy to make. What do you think? I think this is absolutely amazing. And <laughs> remember, the key word. Lamb, double three, six, five, zero. Amazing. Well, there you have it. Mouth-watering lamb ribs and special root vegetables. Mm. Coming up after the break, we are joined by Princess Chantel from the Corano Royal House. We'll see you in a bit.
Welcome back to Afternoon Express, coming to you live on SABC3. Now, today we are in the presence of royalty. Princess Chantelle Revel is here to tell us about her tireless battle to get the Khoisan people recognised. She also shares what she had to encounter in the process. Welcome. How are you? Thank you. Lovely to have you join us today. It's good to be here. Now, Thank you we so mentioned much. Khoisan people in the, in the uh, intro, but as an actual fact, that is a derogatory term. Yeah, yes. Bushman is how you would rather refer to the people. Why? So San What is the is, difference? Is, am I correct in saying San is the derogatory aspect yeah. of the word? Okay. Yeah. You know that um, historically there were two main groupings first, or, or groups of people. It's the Koiko and, and the Bushman. Yeah. Once the Bushman were the hunters and gatherers, and then the Koiko were more post, uh, pastoralists. And then um, later on, it's only 1928, the German gave the name um, Khoisan. They put the two together under the umbrella name. So if, if you look at the history and all the, all the names, as they taken, uh, took away so much of the history and the true culture of people. And San, it's a derogatory term. It actually means um, Kalhat Mensa, <laughs> you know. So wow. you, if you move to the different groupings, they will tell you, but we don't want to be called that. So we were given names over the years. That's derogatory. That, that doesn't mean who we truly really are or where we come from or say who we are. We were never asked. Yes. You know? well, and it's still five... nobody even knows now nobody because knows. it's not yeah. ever highlighted. Yeah. yeah, and the information is not yeah. out there. Yes. So what are the five main groupings of the culture? Well, currently government is working with five groupings because, uh, due to geographical areas. But there's a, a lot more. Like, like you start with the, with, um, the Nama. Mm. Then you get the Griqua, the Bushman, and the Korana. And then you get the Cape Koi, which the people don't like. Mm. Because it's only an umbrella name. The Cape Koi, you get your Hesekwa, your Atakwa, and okay. all the Kwas, that actually means the Kwa, the, the Kwa at the end of, of the tribe's name means people. Yeah. Mm. So if you recognize all of them, in, the Cape, in Cape Town alone, or the whole Western Cape, there was historically about 19 tribes. Wow. Yeah. With, with a Kwa name. And then today with the clans and our families grew, it became later on to 44 known uh, or counting, in clans. counting. So clans is also a groupings that broke away from, from the main tribes like your Karana and your Nama and so forth. But government is only working with the five or busy in the process of recognizing the five yeah. main groupings. Now, you are a princess of the House of Korana, but you weren't born into that title. No. You were recently made a princess. Yes. How, I mean, that gives me hope. I mean, <laughs> you are <laughs> always become a princess. But why were you made a princess? And I explain us about your struggles to get there. Yeah, if I have to start from the beginning, it will really start from the age of eight years old when I first visited the castle, the castle of Kudok. Oh, yeah. You know, the Ku and the Sand people are very um, spiritual people. Mm. So when you get into something, you can't explain it. You just know this thing about yourself. You know in your spirit, but you can't explain. Nobody told you. It's not in the history books. There's no teachers about it. So I went to, on a visit to the castle and at school and stuff. And then I started, you know, when we got into the castle yeah. and stuff, all these things that started happening to me. Like, I know something happened there. But there's no expl explanation for that. You could just that. feel it. Yes, and I started to cry. My teachers didn't know what happened to me. Only, you know, years later when I uh, went to high school at the age of 14, I became involved with the, with the apartheid struggle, you know, the fought against apartheid. I know what it is to be shot at. I know what it is to be locked up. I know what it is to sit in the dark, being, you know, tear gassed and all of that. And um, sadly, years later, after 94, you realize, but none of our stories, the children or the, 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 or the people on the Cape Flats, none of our stories are being told. So many died, just to name one Ashley Krill. I mean, where are those stories really? And, and, and that made me think. Yeah. So what is wrong here? Why aren't we South Africans? Why are we still colored, so-called colored? What yeah. does this name mean? Does it have a culture? Does it have a heritage? People mm. keep on saying so-called co co uh, colored people don't have a heritage. They don't know where they come from. They're mm. somewhere in between black and white and they're made out of black and white, which is so untrue. Yeah. So that set me on my journey to discover who are you really? 
Yeah. You know, and even before, the, like when I really started moving into getting to know tribes, getting to know the people, spirit, uh, the spiritual side also came up. Wow. Um, my previous um, pastor. So it's interrupt. Where did you start looking? I mean, where does one? Like, really where started. do you first go? Who do you <laughs> speak to? <clears throat> I just went. If I heard the name Koi, Koi Koi, or meetings, I just went in for that. So I started with a group that you know that. Um, they say they 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 looking after the coin sign out to get them recognized, fighting for their rights. So would that be the NKC? No, no, no. Way Not before the, before that. the yeah. formation mm -hmm. of yeah, that. before that. So I started getting involved, looking literally, looking, asking around. Do you know people that's working in these groupings? Do you know who these people are? And then, in a short space of about a year, I came to meet all the groupings in Cape Town, the chiefs, the mm. different. And I, I came to know them as, as a people who can tell stories, who know their heritage. And I learned a lot from them, even the, the older chiefs and, and, and people like that. So it was not until I think I first went, after that I first went for, to go uh, to um, University of Pretoria. And there I did the rights of indigenous people. And I learned more as to, wow, oh. we got all these rights as indigenous people, as the first people, but there's no rights for us as so-called yeah. colored, so. Because they're what? not being represented. Exactly. And you not. haven't been recognized as the first people, which no. you are, which yes. is part of your, your fight. Yes. So then after that only, we had another election, the NKC started like 20 years ago already. And I even didn't know about it until later on when I started to move with the groups. And then we had another election in 2012, where the specifically the Cape groupings, uh, they say they went to government, look here, we're not um, uh, represented on this body, and you're speaking to this body and trying to negotiate the rights of our people, and we would like to send in our own. So out of that, that um, I got elected as the Western Cape representative. Right. And then also, you know, now in that I learned a lot as to how, you know, being a woman, that you're not really being accepted culturally. Or taken seriously. Yes, like, yeah. yeah, yeah. All of that came to the forefront and I had my own struggles. How do I represent the people that uh. look for all your faults and then just turn against you just like that? But even in that, I learned that they can't help themselves. You know, being told all these years that... It's you the legacy this, of, yeah. of their past, yeah. And the trauma. So many things happen to our people in the past. You can't... You, like, if you just think about the Nama people specifically, the mm -hmm. lips has been cut off because they were stopped to, you can't speak the language, you know? And we've learned through this, if, even in Cape Town, you had to accept the colored identity to get a job, to get a house. You had to denounce all your rights to your heritage and all of that. So our grandmothers, they never taught us these things. They never taught us the languages. They never taught us really because they were too afraid that if they did, that they might kill us so or hurt us. So that oral tradition obviously yeah. died then. We no. want to hear more of your story, yeah. sorry, because also today we are yeah. or we're also going to, to look into the movie, Kratoa, which is yeah. also very similar to, to that, what you've yeah. been to. Yeah. Well, Princess Chantal has been fighting continuously and consciously for women's rights and the culture of her own people. Now, another such phenomenal woman was Kratoa, as we said yeah. uh, earlier. Stay tuned to find out more after the break. Thank you.
Welcome back to Afternoon Express live on SABC3. Thank you for joining us. Inspired by real life events, our next guest tells the story of Couture. Now, she was a young girl who was taken in by the Dutch settlers as a servant. Now, Kay Ann Williams is the scriptwriter of this compelling documentary. Welcome to Afternoon Express. Thank you. Now, let's start off with who was Couture? Well, Kritoa was um, actually royalty. She was the niece of um, Ochumato, or as most people know, Heri Di Strand Loper, and he was the chief of the Khorna Kona tribe, who were the first inhabitants of Bloberg Strand. Mm. So um, he was Jan van Riebeek's first in interpreter and, and the first person who he interacted with when he came to Cape Town, or the Cape of Good Hope back then. And um, so when I started learning about who Kritoa was. Um, there were a couple of historians who had very like differing opinions about her, and and you find that I mean, if you go to the history books, when I was um, in grade school, there was this one sort of blurb about her, and she was called Eva van Meerhof um, or Kritoa, um, and it basically just said that she was a domestic servant in his house. But in fact. Um, what the historians believe is that either she was taken, because that sometimes happened back then, or uh, her uncle had some kind of a barter with Jan van Riebeek. Yeah. So she entered his household. There were only two women who were with the whole sort of VOC company, and they were these children. And so she started out as a young girl looking after these children. Um, but then uh, Harry or Ochimata was quite sly. And um, so he wouldn't always do what Jan van Riebeek wanted him to do. And so Jan van Riebeek got tired of working with him. And then he recognized that Kritoa had an aptitude for languages. So she learned, uh, Maria, his wife, taught her Portuguese, um, taught her English, taught her Dutch. She learned about five different languages. Wow. And then as a teenager, she became his chief interpreter, which basically meant that she went with him to all the different Khoi tribes and, and negotiated on his behalf um, in the Khoi language. And, um, and so, you know, there was a natural aptitude for languages and just someone who was a peacemaker and someone yes. who knew how to interact with people of all different levels and backgrounds. Um, so this little blurb about this this domestic servant was quite inaccurate, yeah. you know. What was it about Couture, the story, that, that set you on this path? Because, I mean, doing a period documentary is not child's play. Mm. The kind of research that goes mm. into mm. that is quite vast. Well, you know, there was the uh, brief art with the SABC looking for hidden history. So he, things about our history that we don't, that, that not everyone knows about. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was sitting in, in a church service, as you do <laughs> on a Sunday, and the pastor was saying that, you know, the reason why colored people struggle with alcoholism and also of different things is because of this ancestor called Kritoa. And, you know, because I, I don't normally Whoa. just take what people, you know, give me. I started wow. to research and I found out that actually this woman was was so much more than that. And um, after becoming Jan van Riebeek's um, interpreter, you know, uh, her own people started to mistrust her. So they didn't. They didn't understand why she was uh, pleading on behalf of these foreigners who weren't leaving. Because the Cape at that time was just a stop for many people. Mm. They would come, they would refresh, and they would leave. But these people were not leaving. You know, and she was actually bargaining on their behalf. So they felt and, like she was aiding yes, their, their yes, agenda. Yes, and then to add sort of you know fuel to the fire, she at a very young age, as a teenager, married Peter van Meerhof, who was a Dutch surgeon. And so their marriage was the first first interracial marriage recorded in history. Oh, wow. And um, he was made um, the governor of Robben Island. And so she became the first lady of Robben Island, which was basically a place where they would send Khoi people to prison. To prison. You know, and she was in charge. Uh, she was the first lady of that of that place. So, you know, by the time she had married Peter van Meerhof, they had three children. And he died about three years into their marriage. So the Dutch people didn't want to have anything to do with her. And the Khoi people had turned their back on her. Yeah. And then she started getting into alcoholism. Her children were taken away from her and were sent to Mauritius and she never saw them again. And she basically died in Robin, on Robben Island as a prisoner where which, she used to live. Oh, which is almost a re representation of what's happened to many families yeah. that were displaced mm. during that time. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's just a prototype of yeah. how it all ended but up. But you know, the, the thing is that women are not acknowledged for what they do. Yeah. They are not in, in history specifically. You'll find all of these things about all these other men who've impacted our history, but very little about women. So when we did the documentary and we realized what a powerful story it was, we, we then decided, uh, uh, Roberta and I, who Roberta directed the film, that there's a feature film in here. And because everything that we got on Kratoa was in the voice of Jan van Rubik or his scribe, we decided to make the POV of the film absolutely and singularly yes. hers. 
Wow. And so we followed, so we basically asked ourselves, because well, there was nothing to really, besides oh. historians, you know, theses and yeah. those types of things, we had to put ourselves in that position. As a woman, what would you feel like? How would you react? What would your emotional response be? And that's how we formulated and coloured in and textured the story So you first it. did the documentary and then you did the film. Yeah. So yeah. through the, I mean, the d documentary was probably like your, your research ground. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What did you have to go through to find all of this out? I mean, you know, you, ba you basically scratch the bottom of the barrel because it's so little about her. Yeah. So I started out at the Ruland archives and just started, you know, um, looking at what the place looked like, what the cape looked like, what, where she would have been, what, what would her environment be as a little girl. And then what would her environment be in the as a 10 year old to grow up in a completely foreign culture? You know, because when they came here, they lived tongue in cheek with the, um, with the, with the Khoi people. They basically were neighbors and the Dutch would build these like um, um, uh, mud, mud constructs and that's where the fort started so that's where she lived and she was this own the only little girl there who was um of color with all of these men and there were hundreds of them who oh, came here wow. you know so you have to put yourself in a position how vulnerable is she is she really protected and and then maria, maria van rubik was looking after her, but in all of the transcripts they still refer to her as a savage you know so you know at, at some point in, in, in his, in his uh, scripts, Jan van Rubik refers to her as, you know, this apt child, this child who is living with him. And, then, and he's sort of praising her. And then after a while, he says, I'm not sure if she's telling me what I want to hear or, you know, and so you can see that there's a break in that relationship. But what was very interesting about that time, and you know, for many years, Jan van Rubik was the father of our nation. And what was interesting about that is that he left South Africa, wife and all, children and all, with no descendants here. He left after 10 years. But she gave birth to a nation because when, when her children wow. came back after being in Mauritius, her daughter, who is um, Peter Nala, um, had 10 children and they all lived in South Africa, married white, colored black people. And, and so many of our descendants, including our presidents, F.W. de Klerk, even Caspar de Vries, can trace their heritage back to this to woman, couture. you know, and it's some, it's a woman that we have in common. It's a, it's a historical figure that we have in common Incredible. that we don't talk about. That is you know? wow. I mean, as a filmmaker, you must have been salivating with yeah. the texture of the story. <laughs> We're going to get into the film in a little while. Now, don't go away because after the break, we are joined by the beautiful actress, Crystal Donna Roberts. She tells us more about playing the role of Kratoa.
Welcome back to Afternoon Express. Now, before the break, we heard about the story of Kratoa. Now, Crystal Donna Roberts plays the lead role in this captivating film. She's here to tell us about her character and the remarkable woman behind the story. But first, here's a sneak peek. Kratoa. Yeva. Kratoa. Mijn naam is Kratoa. Zij zal je niet teleurstellen. Ook niet haar mensen. Ik zal je een nieuwe naam moeten geven. Ja. 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 Kratoa! Kratoa! This film is so beautiful. Can't so, wait so to beautiful. See it. You are unbelievable. Thank you. So when did much. you first hear about the story of Krita? Funny enough, it was actually, and I have to admit, it's a shameful thing to admit, but the day before I had my audition. And which is one of the things that is so sad about this woman is that we know more about Jan van Riebeek than we do about Kretua. And how much more South African do you get than a Khoi woman in the Cape, you know, Absolutely. back in that day? Um, so I did as much research as I could the, the night before. And then, um, apart from you know, reading up as much as I could, one of the most valuable things for me was talking to Kay on that first day, talking to Roberta, talking amongst cast members, you know, yeah. um, just and, and then also talking to our, our NAMA teachers. It was, it's just like inf information that is so val valuable and beautiful. So, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I, uh, this might sound like an obscure question, but as an actress, I know that when you when you play uh, in a biopic of, of somebody who, who once lived, you almost feel like you're being given your your a um, conduit. Yeah. And and there's the you can't help but feel a spiritual. Um, force working with you in that space. Did you encounter anything close to that? Yes, and I think part of it came with, um, besides the fact that where we filmed, it was just like land and horizon and then the fort that we built, you know. So, and like zero cell phone signal. So, so you are like immediately dived into that world apart from like the costumes and stuff. But what helped a lot for me as well was learning the Nama language mm -hmm. because wow. there's something about the language that is so rooted in the earth. Mm -hmm. And it carries this like wise energy around it. And then you like feel like, oh my word, like, so this is how this language is. So the people who speak this language, that is how they are. So that immediately not only connected me to her, but to the people as mm -hmm. well. Do you still remember any of it? Do you mind giving us a I remember an a bit. Um, well, if I can, because I learned my like dialogue. Yeah. So um, it was, and I hope it's right. Sago ke kauga net se corona hovani abdeko wega hukanka. You know, so that that's just like beautiful. a little bit. Wow. But, yeah. How did you did you work with a dialect coach or I mean yes. that must be so difficult to grasp. Yeah. For and be convincing. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah, and speak it like you're just riding a bike, like exactly. someone would speak a language. Yeah, because there's one thing to like learn a language and there's one thing to like act Embody convincingly it, yeah. in yeah. a language. Have the correct accent exactly. and the correct tone. Yeah. But so we, had, um, we had two teachers, we had Bradley von Sitters mm -hmm. and Auntie Dorothy Davids. And Auntie Dorothy's first language is, is Nama, yeah. she's from yeah. Namibia. So I mean, who better to like teach you the wow. language? That's incredible. Was beautiful. Mm -hmm. What were some of the most difficult scenes to shoot or scenes that you feel like you are ever changed by? Um, well, apart from, like I said, the Nama, um, I think just like as a whole, to play a historical figure that was like so important in that that is so important in South Africa's history, and you've got like zero footage mm -hmm. of what she looked like. You've got no reference. You've got yeah. no reference. There's so a reference to my diva. You don't know what like. she. You don't know what she sounded like. What she walked like. What her size was no. like. What so to like just like come up with this character with the help of of the script and your director and stuff. Yeah. And then obviously the horse riding. Was, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Kay, what did you and, and the director want to bring out of this? What did you want to see come, come alive on screen? You know, I think um, I just wanted a dialogue to be started. Because mm. there, were, there are so, many, so few people who, like if you stop a 16-year-old in the street now, a 16-year-old girl, would she know? Um, mm. who, this, who this woman is and who this woman is to her. You know, so I think that 
Um, we had to take a very clear stance on the relationship between Jan van Riebeek and Kratoa. And I think that a lot of people are not going to be happy with that Absolutely. because uh, he still is uh, the father of a nation to many people. Um, so I was just hoping, and I know Roberti was hoping as well, that we would start a dialogue, mm -hmm. that people would start to talk about who we are, where we come from, and that we actually share so much more than what mm. um, what we believe we share. Yes. You know, that we actually say, share a history and a culture across racial lines. Mm. You know, I think that even though she died so tragic, tragically, her legacy and what makes her important to us is that she lived on through her children yeah. and their children yeah. and their descendants who we can all trace ourselves to. But as a filmmaker, it's so important for you to be making South African stories mm -hmm. so that we can actually learn about our mm -hmm. past. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, it's, yeah. it's so beautiful. The, I can't the wait film to see has it. already won so many awards and mm -hmm. travelled mm -hmm. to numerous film festivals. How has the world received it? And what are some of the questions that come up in the Q&As? You know, I think that um, it is always interesting to see foreigners response to a South African mm. film yeah. you know and we've seen it with other films like Tsotsi and yes. you know where initially when Tsotsi was in South Africa it didn't get that great of a response the minute it started winning awards then people were interested and yeah. curious in South Africa to watch it so the response internationally was uh, the same like a Pocahontas story. Here's a, a, a historical mm. figure where there was a little blurb written about, and so it's something that we can celebrate, and it's been very celebratory. You know, so I mean, I appreciate that, and I'm so proud of the film for that, but what I'm interested in seeing, and I've already started seeing it, is what are people going to say in South Africa? Mm. What are their reactions going to be? And I've already seen some people have very favorable responses and others just being highly offended. Yeah, absolutely. But I mean, I think that... Like, so it's like some are favorable and some aren't, um, but what it is already doing is that it is already sparking a conversation. About her. Absolutely. And that is what oh, it should be encouraged. That's more I'm than you could have hoped for. Thank you so much for sharing the story. Thank you, Leia. Thank you. And guys, make sure you all go see it. Teamwork makes the dream work, and these ladies are clearly making every yes. effort to honor the life of Couture. <laughs> and if you want an epic adventure with a strong message, make sure you go see this film. Coming up after the break, we take a serious look at the increasing water crisis in the Western Cape. We'll be having that conversation after this. Welcome back to Afternoon Express. Now, level four water restrictions were implemented in the city of Cape Town. Despite the rainfall in this province, serious drought is still an issue. We'll have to start looking at alternative ways to save water. And here to tell us more about it is Councillor Xanthia Limburg. Welcome to The Loft. Thank you. 
So how bad is it really? Well, Cape Town and large parts of the Western Cape are in the midst of a very serious drought, the worst in 100 years, essentially. Wow. Um, and even though we've had uh, rainfall over this winter period, our dam levels over the last month have only increased by 6%. So currently, the dam levels are 25.4%, meaning there is 15.4% of usable water. And at this time of the year, to have those storage capacity levels it is um, incredibly critical. Oh. And so the city of Cape Town is working very, very hard to ensure that we can mitigate and adapt acute water shortages. Absolutely. I mean, we all need a, a paradigm shift about this water sure. issue, and we all need to become conscious of it continuously and become water warriors. At a macro level, what, how has Cape Town started to implement um, these restrictions and, mm. and um, conscientizing the population so around it? From a demand side, we have slowly implemented uh, tougher water restrictions, with Level 4 being now effective from the 1st of July. Essentially, we're asking as part of level four that residents uh, reduce their water consumption to 87, 87 litres of liters. water per day. So only using potable water for essential purposes. We are continuing with a pressure reduction. So when you open the tap, you'll notice oh. that the pressure of the water streaming through the tap will be far less. And this oh, is wow. one water saving mechanism. Absolutely. And we are obviously extending and expanding our water and awareness communication campaigns. Wow. But you know what the problem is? Is that when it rains in one area and it's raining bucket loads, you think, oh, glorious, I can go and have a long bath yeah. now because it's raining. But it's and not necessarily going in captive areas, hey? Exactly. It's not going into the uh, captive areas where our dams are located. And we then experience a couple of hot days thereafter, which undoes all of that. Um, but essentially, and the reality of the situation is that it's going to take three consecutive winters of above average rainfall Whoa. to truly replenish our dams. Whoa. So three that years, is how yeah. but three yeah. years of drought ahead of us. What are the mechanisms wow. of a grey water system and how, what would that look like implemented in Cape Town? Well, given the current situation and the low levels of rainfall and climatic uh, unpredictability because of the impact of global warming and climate change, the city is moving towards building a far more water resilient and water sensitive city. So we're in the process of looking at a different or a range of supply schemes, looking at alternative water sources because we are far too reliant on surface water across South mm -hmm. Africa. Mm -hmm. So we are going to diversify a water mix, which includes incorporating, particularly in new builds, uh, grey water systems, uh, trying to encourage residents to start investing in that. We're looking at potentially also incentivizing that through subsidized wow. schemes. But the city has recently put out a request for ideas and information right. to look at potentially partnering with profit and non-profit entities and collaborating with them to see if we can look at a range and a broad holistic water solution that will provide water for the immediate future to avoid acute water shortages, but also to mitigate long-term water scarcity impacts. Yeah. We are planning for a new normal, and that new normal yeah. is water scarcity. Wow. Is it true that there are hundreds and thousands of, you know, when water gathers on the mountain and then kind of streams, that that flows directly into the ocean, into the ocean. and isn't preserved? And that's well, clean, perfect, Some of the water. rainfall uh, does run off to the ocean, and it is required as part of the natural ecosystem. Okay. But a large portion of that is captured through other underground water um, systems as well as our stormwater infrastructure system. And that is repurposed uh, into alternative water um, okay. storage capacity. What about desalination yeah. as a solution? So the city is definitely looking at desalination. As a uh, city that is located along the coastline, uh, we are looking at tapping into desalination so that we can adapt our water uh, supply systems. Uh, we have set aside and reprioritized funding for this within the city and we are hoping through the request for ideas and information that we could potentially also partner with, pri with the private sector to sure. look at um, funding mechanisms that are less burdensome to the city because you would understand yeah. that desalination yeah. is very, very expensive Absolutely. from a capital investment perspective, yeah. from a maintenance perspective, but also from an energy operational perspective. It has to be sustainable yeah. environmentally as well. Exactly. Yeah. So in our quest for solutions to the water crisis, we sent Danilo to find out more about water desalination. Here's what it's all about.
All right, so Jacob, what is water desalination? Basically, water desalination is uh, there's various processes that can, can be used. So it's a process by where fresh water and salts are separated so that you can drink the fresh water. There's thermal processes where you, they basically boil off the water and you use the condensate, and that is your clean water. That's actually the most widely used method, but it's mostly around the Middle East, um, energy rich countries which can afford it. Um, but in countries like South Africa, it's mostly reverse osmosis, which is a membrane process and it basically filters your salt water from your fresh water, it separates it, um, so you sit with a fresh water stream and with a brine stream. Everybody is aware of seawater desalination, but actually the most desalinations in South Africa is actually inland, Borals, Karoo area, Johannesburg, Sassel, Iskor, the big industries, they all use desalination processes for various reasons in, in their factories here. Yeah. And with regards to the plant itself, I mean, how do they turn seawater into drinkable water? So the heart of a, let's talk about a seawater desalination plant, um, is the reverse osmosis membrane. So it's a standard membrane. Um, there's big manufacturers that produce them. And basically under high pressure, you filter the clean water from the salt water. Um, and that's a fairly easy and simple process. But then to make the process work, you need to take the seawater, you need to clean it first to take it through the membrane. So depending on the quality of the seawater, you might need extensive technologies and pretreatment. Um, if you're lucky and you have very clean waters, um, then you don't need it. And then also from such a reverse osmosis process, the water is very clean. Um, so it's not good for your health, you, you can't drink it directly. So you need to add minerals back into that after you've uh, desalinated them. So it's quite a technical process. I mean, in terms of how much water you're extracting from a desalination plant versus the dams, how do they compare? Look, theoretically, you can produce Use all water from, from seawater, um, it's just uh, financially it's, it's not, not viable. So one would typically look at the base load that the desalination provides as a backup um, and to preserve some of your other water sources and that to provide all of the water needs. Let's then zone in on the Western Cape. I mean, they're talking about a two to three year process in order to recover from the droughts that they've had uh, thus far. Is desalination a viable solution to, to that drought? Look, uh, City of Cape Town, they've got a clear roadmap of, of what they're pursuing and, and, and they publish that. So they're looking at aquifer um, extraction, they're looking at uh, municipal reuse, um, they're looking at pump schemes from the Berg River. And part of that long-term plan is definitely uh, desalination as well. Now listen, all South Africans are going to want to ask you one question. What about the moolah? I mean, how much is it going to cost to produce this amount of water on a mass scale? One, one needs to be careful with comp comparing the cost. There's a lot of figures around in the media and, and one really needs to look what is included in that cost. You know, the one guy would say, no, it's very inexpensive, you know, but maybe only looks at the desalination process and doesn't take to, into account from the sea all the way to the tap. Um, so current figures that, that we see is basically to operate, provide the energy, maintenance, chemicals, everything for a fairly large desalination plant. You probably talk around eight rand per cubic meter, but then there's still capital financing. The plant needs to be paid off and amortized um, over time, and that will probably add another eight rand as well. Um, so you probably look at the 16 rand total price, including ev everything, including financing. But then obviously there's still cost on the municipal side for conveyance and get it to your, to your tap. So let me play devil's advocate for a second Yeah, The Western Cape government has asked everybody to reduce their water consumption overall, but it sounds to me like there are lots of solutions to the problem thus far. So should we still try and consume less water? What are your thoughts? Yeah, no, I think my personal feel is that you need to try to, to, to save water. Um, I mean, there's bigger and bigger pressures on the environment. People are getting more. Um, so we definitely, for me personally, um, with the droughts, I've halved my consumption at my house just by implementing basic principles. But it, uh, it only occurred once the pressure was there. So I think we should definitely continue that drive. So from that salty taste you get in your mouth from diving in the waves to drinking beautifully clean water out of your taps, I mean how do you get that water from the salty sea to, to my tap? There's two methods. One is basically to drill a borehole on the beach and you extract um, uh, seawater through a bottle, so it's already filtered. Um, so the water is fairly clean and it's a less expensive treatment process and a less expensive plant. But that's more for your smaller type of plants, your Plettenberg Bay, Nysna type plants that we've installed. But as soon as you get to bigger plants like the Marshall Bay plant, then it's not feasible anymore to use borals and then you start to look at open seawater intakes. So the moment you have open seawater intakes, there can be algae, red tides, other organisms coming from the ocean and then you need a more extensive treatment process. So typically your first step to, to have some kind of screening or drum filtration to remove your bigger and, and coarse particles. And then you will have some form of a filtration process, either sand filtration or membrane filtration. 
and then after that you will go to your desalination process, your membranes where you will do the desalination, and then after that you will do your remineralization to add in the good minerals, and then you will do your final chlorine uh, disinfection. So what does it then take to run one of these plants? I think the actual expertise in South Africa, we're lucky, We've, we're a fairly industrialized country, so I think the basic principles is, is the same. So to do the operation of maintenance afterwards, I think we've got enough expertise in South Africa. I think where the specific expertise come in is to do the upfront engineering selection of the correct site, the correct technology and the correct size of the plant um, for that specific town or city, and I think that, that's probably where the expertise uh, will come in. But what it typically would involve, once the plant has been constructed, uh, we can take the Mosel Bay plant as an example. It's a 15 megalitre per day plant. Um, and there you will probably have 10 to 15 people that operate the plant. One of my first questions about desalination is the impact on the environment. Are we not just now depleting another resource on our planet? Look, I think South Africa has got very good systems and, 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 and legislation in place. So I can't just go and build a desalination plant. There needs to be a proper environmental impact assessment that's conducted by a professional uh, body. And we've taken part in some of those and um, it's a good process where everything is considered and, and the biggest impact is the brine return to the ocean. So it will look at the specific place, you know, so they will not discharge the brine into the coastal area where there will be a lot of damage. They will typically take it in deeper where there's a lot of dilution effect in a fairly small area um, to minimize the impact. Excuse my pun, but it sounds to me like this could become quite a fishy process. Do you guys end up extracting a whole bunch of sea creatures? Yeah, look, if it's open water extraction, for example, if you take the Mosel Bay one, it's a couple of hundreds meters offshore that you extract it, so it's not right in that active marine zone that you extract it. So the plant will be designed and the intake will be positioned in such a manner that minimal impact is caused to the environment and the fish, um, and screening systems will be put in place to prevent fish uh, from being sucked into the plant. So it seems that water desalination could contribute to water conservation in the Western Cape, but it's going to come at a huge cost. It's still up to each and every resident in the Western Cape to use water responsibly. Welcome back. I'm so glad that we're being educated about what's happening with the water in, in, yeah. in Cape Town. It's a serious issue. And during the break, we chatted about, um, we chatted with uh, Ms. Limburg about the um, Law enforcement, Penalties, that is, yeah, a zero yeah. tolerance approach to people wasting water in mm -hmm. Cape Town. So people need to watch out about that. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what do you think of the movie Krotoa? And what are you hoping and wh where does it look like the outcome is going to come of, of the constitutional recognition <laughs> of the Bushman people? Um, it's the first time in history that something like this. I'm so grateful and I'm... I'm, uh, um, I was, I'm going to the premiere, mm -hmm. yeah, so um, I'm looking forward to it. It's something that I can, you can now physically show to the, to the people and they can be proud of it. You know, it's not yeah. just Cape Gangs and Cape Flats and all the ugly stuff that, that made our people into who they are today. But really looking something forward to something, telling a story, that's what happened, that, you know, mm. I'm proud. Yeah. I'm so proud that our stories are, you know, are being told out. It's out there mm -hmm. and people can actually go and start speaking about mm -hmm. it. You're not just a colored. This mm -hmm. is who you yeah. are. Be proud of who you are yeah. and where you come from. Mm -hmm. Embrace your heritage. Mm -hmm. Know who you are. And that's been our struggle mm -hmm. in getting constitutionally recognized. Because we recognize each other. We know who we are. Yeah. How come the country doesn't? Yeah. You know? yeah. So it's, it's been yeah. so amazing having you yeah. here. And yeah. I'm so happy that I'm finally friends with the princess. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm actually looking forward to a time when a, a platforms for young children to have yes. this history passed on to them early yeah. enough so they um, don't have to do the hard work that yeah. you guys have yeah. already gone ahead and yeah. done. Yeah. And well done on an amazing movie. Everybody has to go <laughs> and see it. <laughs> Everybody's yes. got to go and watch Kratoa. <laughs> thank you so much thank for, you. for coming to the thank show. You so and much. thank you so much for joining us. Absolutely. Of course, we're going to be back again tomorrow. Yeah, and everybody here is going to devour the spoon. <laughs> 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 Happy eating. Thank you. Cheers. Good night. <laughs> Please check <laughs> in. Express.
Made with love by Clover. Another feel-good production.